Okay, this is uh, James uh, for Beginners, Practical Christianity, lesson number nine uh, in this series. Title of this lesson, Who's the Boss? Who's the Boss? And we will cover uh, quite a bit of territory tonight, uh, chapter four, verse 13, and we'll try to get all the way to chapter five, verse six. Um, have you ever uh, uh, noticed that we always take God into consideration when we are sick? Notice all the prayer requests, you know, 80% of those prayer requests are always for people who are sick, having surgery of some kind. Or if we're having trouble in our relationships, you'll hear the person say, well, should pray for, uh, we need to make important decisions in our marriage. Well, usually they're having problems, you know, that's uh, troubles in the relationship. Um, we pray about church things, Father let us grow, help us to you know, expand the youth group, all those type of things. But we rarely consider His sovereignty in business affairs. I have not yet one time heard a prayer request by anyone in this congregation in the last seven years that actually requested help or some kind of wisdom for their business for their financial affairs. We pray over meals, we pray for the sick, we pray for the poor, but when was the last time we saw a prayer offered over a business deal? So in his epistle, James tells us that failure to go to God in prayer about business dealings, failure to consider Him as Lord over our financial affairs will lead us to three dangerous outcomes, and that's really the kind of the meat of this uh, particular lesson. The first of which is arrogance. Arrogance is a, a feeling of superiority, you know, the making of great claims, boasting of our worth without regard to God. And basically James is saying, you know, failure to go to God when talking and when thinking and when planning about financial or business affairs um, has a, um, a sense of arrogance about it. Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. And so he says, you know, making plans for the future without considering God is arrogant because who knows or who can guarantee uh, the future except, except God. James says that uh, these business people plan as if they were in control. You know, the way you know, he's kind of not quoting, but he's paraphrasing what some people are saying. We're going to do this. We're going to go for a year over here. We're going to make some money. You know, as if they knew what was going to happen in a year. In reality, life is, you know, is not so sure, right? Verse 14, he says, yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You're just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. You know, in reality, James says, life is, is not so sure. It's like a vapor, very fragile. Here today, gone tomorrow, forgotten two, two days later. Have you ever been in a restaurant or sometimes in the bathrooms, you know, they put up this old fashioned wallpaper and on the wallpaper they have products from long ago, like a hundred years ago or something like that. All these interesting quaint soaps and lotions and you know, washing machines where you have to crank by hand and you, that's so cute. We, don't even, we can't even relate to any of these products. And yet at the time, these were the, these were the things that people were we're using, these were businesses that were employing many, many people. I remember working for a, before I went into preaching, I worked for a company where we imported musical instruments and you know, we, we gave lessons and designed workbooks for students and we had designed a brand new workbook, a new method if you wish, and we had sent it to a graphic artist who was going to you know, print it up for us. Well, the graphic artist, he had this letter set, it was called letter set, it was you know, these sheets with letters on it and he had a, like a little knife and he would lay the letter set down and he'd 
you know, one letter at a time. Everything was so tedious. It took them days and months you know, to lay out the entire book. Well, his job was obsolete in a heartbeat once computers came out. What well, used to take him you know, a month to do could be done in a day with someone who who had a computer and yet he had his future laid out. Yeah, I'm going to get my own business and I'm going to hire some guys and you know, instead of me working by myself with the little knife and the little letter set one letter at a time, I'm going to hire five people to do that and I'm going to multiply my production. He didn't know what was coming down the pike <laughs> for his business and that's what James is saying. You don't know what will happen tomorrow. In verse 15 he says, instead you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or do that. Because what we do, we do because God permits it. We live because God permits us another day and He does so in order to store up for vengeance or for blessings. You know, recently, we, we've just heard in the last day uh, an actor in a popular uh, a television series, um, Alan Thicke, passed away, 69 years old. They showed a picture of him just like two weeks ago at a, at a thing, at a Hollywood thing that he was at. Handsome man, didn't look his age at all, trim, you know, had all his hair, some of us can be jealous. He died, how? He was playing hockey with his 19 year old son and had a massive heart attack and died. His, his calendar was full with appearances. I'm going to be here and then there's this event and then I think I'm scheduled to do this and, and his agent was planning things for him. I guarantee you when he woke up in the morning on that day, the only thing he had on his calendar was that he was going to you know, play sports with his son. Dying was not part of the equation on that day. And yet God didn't give him another day. This was his last day. And that's what James is saying. Verse 16, but as it is, you boast in your arrogance and all such boasting is evil. You know, pretending that one has control of the future to the extent of boasting about what one will do with the future is evil indeed, is arrogant indeed. It's not that we can't make plans, we have to make plans, of course. But to assume that we have the future, this is where the arrogance comes in. Verse 17, therefore he says, to one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. Now we use this, you know, this is like a general purpose phrase here that we use all over the place, but in context, Knowing, you know, is it to the, the one who knows the right thing? The right thing here is the knowledge that we don't have the future. If you know that there is a God and God gives you one day at a time and you don't own the future and you ought to be respectful to God about the future and you ignore that, then for you that's sin. That's, that's the context of this particular one. So the Christian needs to know that the future is in God's hand and his plans for the future need to be put into God's hands first, whatever those plans are. Whether our business fails or succeeds, this is not the point from a spiritual perspective. What determines our guilt or innocence before God in this area is not the success or failure, it is whether we have put the matter into his hands or not. Not to do so is a sign of arrogance. That's what, that's, what James is, you know, that's what James is getting at here. God didn't judge you based on you know, how, how well you succeeded or failed in your business. He's not looking at the books. You know, maybe he's looking at the books to make sure you're honest, but you know, he's not looking at the books to judge you based on how much money. You don't get an extra pass into heaven if you've got a fat bank account when you leave earth. James is saying that the way that you please God is that you lay the future in His hands. Another thing that this produces is greed. Remember I said three dangers? Another thing this produces is uh, greed. Greed is the attitude where 
one is never satisfied. There's never enough money. There's never enough powder, uh, power. There's never enough uh, comfort, uh, control. Uh, never enough. Never enough. It is the failure to control the natural desire to acquire and the pleasure that comes with it. That's what greed is. Rich people are greedy, poor people are greedy. It's not, it's not a question of rich and poor, it's a question of the condition of a person's soul. So the Christian needs to be wary of greed in his business dealings because the greedy rich will be punished. We're not punished because we are rich, we're punished because we are greedy. The big difference there. And so in verse one of the next uh, chapter he says, come now you rich, weep and howl for your miseries which are coming upon you. And so James warns the greedy rich of the judgment that is coming and if they knew they would start to weep now. That's his point. Verses two to three. He says, your riches have rotted and your garments have become moth-eaten. Your gold and your silver have rusted and their rust will be a witness against you and will consume your flesh like fire. It is in the last days that you have stored up your treasure. So in these verses he describes the danger of greed. The true condition of earthly wealth is that it's already rotting away and one day it'll be destroyed forever. Greed has a way of tying us to wealth and thus keeping us prisoners of things. You ever know people who are prisoners of things? They can't let things go? The point is that those tied to things will ultimately be destroyed along with their things. If you're tied to things in this world, you better watch out because you know, the Bible says everything will be consumed right at the end of the world. Everything burn up. All things will be burned up. Imagine if you're tied to your things, you can't let go your things. When Christ appears in order to reveal the glory of heavenly and eternal things, the worthlessness of earthly treasures will be revealed and this revelation will be the testimony or the accusation against the greedy rich. Not just the rich, the greedy rich. And so he's saying they set their hearts on worthless things which demonstrated the value of their own hopes. Their <laughs> hopes are in vain. If your hope rests on things, you don't have any hope. And James says they'll be destroyed along with their things or along with their wealth. And then the third thing he talks about is injustice. The three dangers of not considering God in affairs of finance or business. Arrogance, greed, injustice. Arrogance and greed are the basic attitudes to watch out for in money and business matters. Injustice is the overt sin that one does against another because of our arrogance and greed. In verse four he says, Behold, the pay of the laborers who mowed your fields and which has been withheld by you cries out against you and the outcry of those who did the harvesting has reached the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. So those who become rich by depriving others of what is their due, in other words, cheating, lying, extortion, manipulation, fraud. People who make their wealth in this way, these are the people he's talking about. And so James, he pictures a rich farmer holding back some of the salary of his poor laborers on some pretext. And he says that the wages themselves cry out to God for justice and will be a voice condemning a judgment. It's quite picturesque. He's not saying that the laborers are crying out. He's saying the money that the rich landowner owes these people, that money is crying out to God. And that money will be the witness against the rich, greedy landowner in judgment. Very you know, tremendous imagery there. 
So the Lord of Sabaoth, that's not the Sabbath, by the way. The Lord of Sabaoth means the Lord of hosts, the Lord of the armies. And that term speaks to the power of the judge, which is God. Who's the judge and what kind of power does he have? Well, he's the Lord of Sabaoth, meaning he's the Lord of the armies of heaven. He's the Lord of hosts. You better be careful because he has all the power necessary to judge anyone who is rich, anyone who is powerful, and he's capable of punishing, and he's capable of exacting justice when justice will be uh, required. Of course, you know, we, we, live, we live in a, you know, a free country. We can travel where we want to, marry who we wish, we can you know, eat what we, you know, the government, I know some people think it's too intrusive, and, but really compared to some other nations, you know, we are free in this country to be and do as, and say as we please. James was not writing here to, to Americans. You know, this is in the first century. He's writing to a world where most of the people are either enslaved or you know, have no rights whatsoever. There is no, quote, middle class. There are the, the ones in power and those who are wealthy, and then there are the rest, the, the military class, and then the rest are just the poor. So this was quite a, an indictment. Reading this, okay, in the church, in the first century, was powerful stuff. And there were people in the church who were wealthy. And this was quite a calling out of those individuals if they were not doing what they needed to do in the name of the Lord. So he goes on in verse five and he says, you have lived luxuriously on the earth and led a life of wanton pleasure. You have fattened your hearts in the day of slaughter. So the imagery here again, you feed an animal to fatten him up, looking towards the day that you're going to slaughter him. The poor beasts, you know, he doesn't even know what's going to happen to him. It's a fool's paradise. Man, look at his free food. You know, they're giving me food all the time. I get to eat all the time. That's wonderful. You know? <laughs> Obviously, I'm, I'm joking here, but you know, you know, the, 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 the rancher knows why he's feeding that animal. He's getting them ready for slaughter. He wants them to be fat. Well, this image is carried over by James. He's saying the arrogant rich who feed themselves on luxury at the expense of the poor are in effect being fed by their own greed, preparing themselves for their own slaughter at judgment. Yeah. Go ahead, God says, go ahead, ignore me. Go ahead, feed yourself on this world. Go ahead, get nice and fat, cheat, Lie, steal, sure, go ahead and do that. You're just getting yourself ready for the judgment. In verse six he says, you have condemned and put to death the righteous man. He does not resist you. I mean their ultimate sin of injustice is the death of the innocent who are unable to defend themselves. The helpless poor are sacrificed in order to preserve the wealth of the greedy rich. You know, I said we live in America and I'm not saying this doesn't happen anymore. Of course it happens. It just happens less in this country than it does in other countries. I mean, you look at countries in Africa. Never mind, look at countries like Haiti. I mean, all other nations went to Haiti and they made deals with the rich of that island and they completely raped that island of all of its natural resources. They took everything out of the ground that you could take, made themselves rich and left. And now you have an island of people who have no natural resources with which to kind of trade to lift themselves out of dire poverty. James is saying to the people who did that, the people in thousand dollar suits in, in big boardrooms who are you know, dealing politely and uh, you know, uh, graciously with one another in high society, he's saying to these people, your time will come. Your time will come. So this is the ultimate injustice caused by arrogance and greed. 
just like murder is the ultimate sin of anger and resentment, and adultery is the ultimate sin of lust, death of the poor is the ultimate sin of injustice caused by greed and uh, arrogance. And as I mentioned, history is full of examples of the poor being trampled underfoot by greedy and arrogant wealth. So James warns those who are involved in business to be careful in their affairs because they're always in danger of falling into the sins of arrogance and greed and injustice. These, he says, will be punished by God. And, and one of the major dangers of wealth, uh, you know, and, and you know, compared to the people he's talking to, we're the wealthy. We, we, you and I, we're the wealthy ones in this world. You know, we, we, we're able to drink coffee for a buck a cup because some child is picking coffee beans for a dollar a day somewhere. We're able to buy cheap electronics because somebody is working at four dollars an hour somewhere else under terrible conditions. So we can, hey man, it's 4K TV, 8K TV. Oh man, I bought this sucker for $600. What a deal, how did that happen? Well, that happens because people are paid slave wages in other nations. The danger with wealth, whether it's individual wealth or corporate wealth like we have in this country, is that it tends to create a bubble around us that makes us immune to the suffering of other people. It's only when you travel or in the military, you go to other countries and you, you see how people live, you actually see it. That opens your eyes. But that's the great danger here in America. Here in America, the, the great danger to our collective souls is not, you know, sexual perversion, I mean there's plenty of that, you know, or, or, or alcohol, or no. The greatest danger to our collective souls in America is worldliness, stuff. Everywhere I look, they're building more what? They're building more storage places, why? Because people have so much junk they not only have enough room for the junk in their houses, now they have to actually rent space to keep their junk. Talk about tied to your stuff. That's the danger in our nation, for all of us, me included. So as Christians involved in business, and for us, I don't see a lot of independent business people here. I see people who work for the government or work for hospitals and that, you know, we're kind of a working class church here. You know? So for people who have their own business or who have financial dealings, what should our attitude be? Number one, bring all matters all matters, including business and financial matters, before God in prayer. Realize that He alone holds the future in His hands. This is the mark of a wise and humble man or woman in Christ. Prayer is always the businessman's first step. A businessman, a businesswoman should be a man or woman of prayer. And this is where my title comes from. In business, God is the boss. He's the boss. Number two, recognize that God distributes wealth as a tool for service towards others, not as something to hoard up for our own security <laughs> and pleasure. Let's read 2 Corinthians. 6 to 11, he says, now this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must do just as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every 
good deed. As it is written, he scatters abroad, he gave to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in everything for all liberality, which through us is producing thanksgiving to God. Kind of a long passage. Basically, Paul is speaking to the Corinthian church here about their offerings at church. And he's saying, God gives us abundance so we can provide for ourselves first and for others. And for others. Why? Because this gives glory to God because um, those you help will bless him because of the generosity of his children. So you get, you know, God gives to you and you're saying, thank you God, I have enough for myself and, and I have enough to give to someone else. And that person who receives from you will also be thanking God. Dear God, thank you for the generosity of my brother or this sister who has helped me in my time of need. It's like he gets thanksgiving and glory from two people. He's doubling. He's doubling the glory, doubling the thanksgiving, doubling the joy. And then secondly, this protects the Christian against greed and Selfishness. Yeah. Giving, giving is not about what you do for somebody else necessarily. It's not only about that. What I give to the church will enable the church to do this and support missionaries and you know, do the work of the Lord. It's about that. Yes, it is about that. But we, we also have another, there is also another reason for the giving that God is reminding us through James. Giving protects us. It protects us against selfishness, against self-centeredness, against being greedy. When we keep everything we get, when we hoard every single thing that we like and that we want and, and nobody can have any of it, we're, we're, not, we're not doing ourselves any favors. We're reinforcing greed. We're reinforcing selfishness. John Wesley, you know the Wesleyan church? John Wesley died with only $200 in his bank account. Now remember, 1703, you know, in the 1700s, $200 was still you know, a considerable amount of money, but not a fortune. 200 bucks. In his lifetime, however, he gave away a total of $5 million in order to start orphanages and other benevolent works. That's almost like 50 to 100 million dollars today. He gave it away. He was a dynamic businessman and a powerful man for good works. And someone once asked him what his secret for success was. And here's his answer. I fling money out of my hands as quickly as possible, lest it finds its way into my heart. Where your treasure is, that where, that's where your heart will be. If your treasure is money or things, that's where your heart will be. That's where your heart will be set on. That's where your heart will beat a little faster over money or things. You know, I pray that when it comes to business, Jesus will always be in control of our hearts and not money. And hopefully we'll be, all of us, able to avoid arrogance or greed or the uncontrolled desire to constantly acquire. 
And it's not easy, brothers and sisters, because we live in a society where we are bombarded 24 hours a day on our phones, on TV, on our tablets, our mailboxes. I mean, buy this, buy this, do this, get another one of these, two for one, 40% off. Does coal ever sell anything full price? Right? And heaven help you if you buy stuff online. What happens if you buy stuff online? Oh, oh man, I mean your phone after that, the pop-ups for your, you know, the thing I bought three years ago, I've seen 75 different versions of it popping up in my email and in my messages, you know, because they've got my number. I like golf stuff. So let's be careful with that. Next week, the last lesson in this particular series entitled Four PS's from James. All right, that's our lesson for tonight. Thank you very much for your attention.